Welcome to another edition of Against the Current, coming to you from the Skyline Club atop the Old Republic Building in downtown Chicago. This week, our guest, Congressman Peter Roscom, the successor, not just temporally to Congressman Henry Hyde, but also philosophically. Peter Roscom, thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate Dan, it. good to be with you. Thank so you. So let, let's start right there. So Henry Hyde was this larger-than-life figure, larger-than-life congressman for 35 years in the western suburbs of Chicago, one of the intellectual leaders of Congress during his time, kind of a gentle giant. Um, and you've been in Congress now after succeeding him for just about a decade. Mm -hmm. Give us a little bit of perspective about what that decade's been like and how you've seen the House change from 2006 when you were elected to present day. The institution is really different now. And um, you can make arguments plus or minus, and we can let your viewers decide about what the disposition is in the final judgment. But what we're actually witnessing now is the devolution of the office of speaker. So when Gingrich became speaker in the mid-90s, he pulled a lot of authority into the office of speaker. And that model was maintained from Gingrich to Hastert to Pelosi and to Boehner for about 20 years. But then the world changed underneath John Boehner, essentially, and changed dramatically. And now with Paul Ryan now in the speaker's chair, he's essentially pushing out a lot of power, out to rank and file, out to committee chairman, and so forth. And so you could argue that this is going back to the days when Henry Hyde was a younger member of Congress, actually. It almost when, feels, I mean, you mentioned Gingrich, it almost feels it's intra-party, so that's not quite a parallel, but it almost feels like Gingrich and the backbenchers rising up against Bob Michael as the minority yeah. leader and rising up against an imperious speaker in Jim Wright, and ultimately, after 94, kind of having their day for a, for a time. Yeah, I think that's spot on. And, and the irony now, that's gone full cycle, essentially. And so, so Ryan comes in. Everybody was surprised when, when Boehner made his announcement that Friday morning, late September. Um, and, and, and people started immediately to run for office subsequent offices, which I found very troubling. And we had to pump the brakes and slow it down and say, look, we have a speaker that's stepping down, not because of health or not because of loss of election or scandal, but because he doesn't have enough support within his own party. And the idea that we're just going to run for office to, to succeed all these things now is ridiculous. So the process got slowed down. And as you know, ultimately, the House turned to Ryan and said, you got to run for speaker. Well, that's the interesting thing about it, too. This wasn't, I mean, especially when you consider what the Democrats did with Pelosi after losing successive elections, after losing the speakership, and there she's still the leader right. there. John Boehner holding the majority for successive elections and still losing faith. Right. What does that say, not just about the changing house, but the changing house as it reflects the changing attitudes of Republican the Republican electorate? Well, I think we've got a couple challenges. One is we've got an instant gratification culture that wants what it wants when it wants it. And I've fall into this category. I'm, I, I have a high expectation that I'm, you know, I can go to my airline app and click on a flight and all that sort of stuff and get it done very, very quickly. That is saturated all of us, Dan. But now that is now into relationship with a system of governance that the founders couldn't even contemplate instant gratification. It was like not even a part of their, their, uh, their worldview at all. They created a system that said, we're very suspicious of fast government. We're going to spread all this power right. out. So here's what we got to do. We've got to reconcile those two things. And I think what Ryan is trying to do as speaker is to say, look, part of the weakness that we've had and the frustration that people have had over Congress over the past several years is they've not heard the big vision. What's the big picture? What is the aspiration? And why is it that we're conservatives? And why do we think that a conservative worldview is better and creates more prosperity and more safety and so forth, these things that, that we aspire to. So what Ryan is doing is saying, let's create that sense of aspiration. Then if you've got to take an incremental step to get there, then the public can say, okay. And the political base can say, I can take that next step so long as you're willing to tell me where it is that you want to go. So the weakness, I think, in the past has been a lack of that larger vision. Well, I think, but, but the whole instant gratification piece is interesting too, because one of the weaknesses, it seems to me, it's twofold with the Republicans as the majority party, both in the House and the Senate. One is a perception that kind of they're rolling over to Obama. They're letting the Obama agenda roll forward when they could be more aggressive in blocking what they could block in the majority because they don't want to do things in the Senate, for example, like exercise the nuclear option. 
Uh, number two, it's this idea, even with Paul Ryan, who's been ahead of the learning curve on matters of entitlement reform, but it, it's a difficult rallying cry. Uh, what do we want? Entitlement reform. When do we want it? By 2042. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just difficult to galvanize the passions of the public when you're talking about things generations from now. I get it. And people are living in real time their micro lives and their micro lives over the last 15 years, Republican presidents and Democrat Congresses, Democrat presidents and Republican Congress, their, their lives, particularly middle income folks, have not improved during that 15 year period. So there's a lot to respond to. One is, <clears throat> you're right, the capacity to get a bumper sticker sort of phrase is a very, very difficult thing to do. But you know and I know the, the avoidance behavior that we've seen in the state of Illinois is a great example of what not to do. Mm -hmm. So it does have a real impact. If we don't deal with Medicare, for example, on a timely basis, it's crowding out all these other things that we desperately care about, research and, dis and disease uh, uh, Hey, what are you what, talking what, about? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, George is, Burns. Is the, science, is the science settled on that yet? Yeah. Um, the, <laughs> so, uh, but be a conference you know, in Paris on cigars. <laughs> uh, you know, R and D on um, you know r research and diseases, infrastructure spending, all these sort of things that are crowded out based on you know Medicare that's taking more and more and more. My point is, if we deal with these things and communicate to the public, this stuff matters. It matters to you now. It may seem a little esoteric, but it does matter to you now. That's part of an office holder's job to be able to communicate that. The other thing is. The best example, I, th I think, is, is Jefferson. So Jefferson, no stranger to the big picture, is right, you know, he authored the Declaration of Independence. But for 14 years after he wrote that, he wrote a letter to a guy named Charles Clay, who was a pastor. And he wrote, and he said, the ground of liberty is to be gained by inches. We must be content what we can get from time to time and eternally press forward for what is yet to get. It takes time to persuade men even to do what is for their own good. So we've got to do both of these things. And I think both of them meaning communicating to a political base these core values that we're willing to lose an election over, importantly. Yes. Okay. Um, and also, these are the steps that we need to take to get there. And I think if we can do that, we can bridge this and ultimately and ultimately prevail in these elections. So that what are we willing to lose an election over is key. Because as somebody that's kind of on the outside looking in, I think a lot of people see this, Democrats, it's kind of ironic, Democrats seem to be bigger political risk takers than Republicans, the party of entrepreneurial capitalism, right? Productive risk taking. Democrats were willing, as they proved, to lose their majority in Congress over, over Obamacare. Obamacare. Yeah. They're willing to lose it. Content. The president certainly was. He was willing to see Democrats lose their congressional seats. Republicans are unwilling to lose majorities over blocking something that 60% of the people still don't like almost a decade after its passage. So the question becomes, if we elect a Republican president, whoever it is, and you've got Republican majorities in the House and the Senate, what are Republicans willing to risk their majority mm. to do that's transformative? And not just repeal all the bad stuff mm -hmm. that President Obama did, Obamacare and Dodd-Frank and some of these other uh, regulatory uh, burdens on economic growth and job creation. But what are they willing to do to transform government? Because it seems to me, and I think to a lot of people, that uh, Democrats run to the right as fiscal conservatives and govern left, and Republicans run to the right as conservatives, fiscal and otherwise, and govern left. Mm. And so you have the kind of waving of a flag, but you're not even advancing the flag inch by inch in the direction of free mm. minds and free markets and truly smaller government. You're essentially playing the Democrats game. And this is why we look at it and say, uh, you know, this isn't about not getting anything done. We're not getting anything done. Well, how do we have a hundred trillion dollars in unfunded liabilities and uh, a government, a $4 trillion government that is so unwieldy and so cumbersome, we can't even provide health care to veterans uh, effectively and efficiently. So go back to Thatcher. First you win the debate, then you win the vote, she said famously. So let's, since we focused in on it, um, let, let's look at, look at the Medicare question in particular. Medicare is on a trajectory, to, trajectory towards insolvency. Super popular program, people like it, but it's going broke. I mean, it effectively is. The payroll tax doesn't pay for it. That's right. So the, the question is, all right, so what, what's the remedy? 10 years ago, it was crazy talk. And I mean 
crazy talk to be talking about, and it was politically very, very dangerous to be talking about making changes to Medicare. Now those changes have become normalized, and I would argue that they've become they've become now orthodoxy in our party. Remember when the when the the um, oh, when you say take, you mean Medicare Part D, the expansion of Medicare? No, I'm talking about taking on Medicare as an entitlement and 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 its reformation, meaning telling people it's going to be different. It and and it may be because less, but because but this is the part of the problem. The last time Republicans were in control, what did they do to Medicare? Expanded it. Yeah. Part okay. D. Um, fair point, but can, but but give me a little bit of time op in the open field. No. So <laughs> uh, so on on Medicare in particular, the the ability to come back when the House passed that bill. You remember when Gingrich came out and he said this is right wing social engineering. Yeah. And it didn't end well for Gingrich. He had to back off very very quickly, and that was a pivotal point. That was a moment at which the debate there was proof that the debate had switched, and now people were willing to say. I can hear you if you're talking about making changes, and I can understand it. And the proof of it is Romney and Ryan won the senior vote. Now, they didn't win the senior vote based on taking on a lot of, you know, going after Medicare and people thinking that they're going to cut their Medicare. They were able to communicate effectively, no, we're going to fix this thing. That's the debate that, that we've got to win and we've got to prevail on. One other point. We have seen under Obama the, the the back and forth between the branches of government. And now it's been a decades long enterprise, this ebb and flow between executive and legislative in particular. And we see now the legislative branch is at a, is at a low point in terms of in, if its influence. It's not just a, you know one episode or two episodes, but it's a, it's, it's a decades long proposition. And you can begin to see the reclamation of some of that. Now here's part of the remedy. Why, and this is what I would propose to our new speaker, have every committee chairman go out and have an Article One, uh, an Article One project. And by Article One, I mean, be looking out over the landscape and pick some fights with the administration. Because clearly, what the liberals are doing, they lay awake at night and they think, hey, let's go do this, let's go do that. Conservatives basically whack them all, chase this, change that, and are, and are responding. Instead, let's say, let's, let's take the initiative here. We've tried to do that with some of the things that I've been active with on the IRS side. You've got then a better process by which you deal with the appropriations process, because that, that allows you to do limitations amendments and pick some fights. But I think that there's a lot to do and a lot of opportunity. So on Medicare, I mean, you talked about Paul Ryan and Mitt Romney winning the senior vote. But Andrew McCarthy in National Review Online said of Ryan and Romney, the problem with the Ryan-Romney ticket, or Romney-Ryan, it's a little wishful thinking on my part, uh, was both of them were sentinels for the welfare state. That's what Andrew McCarthy said. In other words, they conceded the premise of the other side. They're essentially just arguing, we can make it a little bit more efficient. Hmm. We can make it a little bit more cost effective. We can you know, reduce the overhead and the the, uh, uh, you know, bend the cost curve over the next 30, 40, 50 years. And that just is not enough distinction for the American public. Hmm. I mean, is that a fair criticism? I don't know. I think that's a little bit of an overstatement. If you're, um, if you're, if, if, if you're the one that's proposing the changes, so I'll, I'll, I mean, when Ryan first started proposing the changes to Medicare that he did 10 years ago, it was fringe stuff. It was outlier. Right. I mean, it was it was really no, no, no. We don't you don't talk about that in company that wants to keep a majority. And and the threat was if if you talk about these things, this is how you jeopardize a majority. What he did was he said, look, let's normalize them. Let's take let's take the argument out there. So if McCarthy's point is that 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 it's not good enough, okay, then let's continue to build a base. But it falls McCarthy's argument falls into the same trap that says, well, it's not perfect. These guys don't well, want right. to blow the whole system uh, Right, up. you don't make the perfect enemy the good. But um, So maybe the way to do it is Tyler Cohen, the economics professor at George Mason, he, he wrote this book at, uh, about uh, averages over. And one of the arguments he makes to some on the right, the free market types, including like our friend Steve Moore, who says you've got makers and takers. He says it's, not, it's actually it's a lot more complicated mm. than that. So, so a Medicare recipient today will receive approximately one and a half to two times more in health care than they paid into the system. Now, is that person a maker or a taker? That person paid into the system according to the rules of the game that the politician set up and is accessing the program according to the rules of the game the politician set up. So is that person a, ta a taker 
Or is that person a maker and the rules of the game need to be changed? He would argue the latter, and I would agree with him. Mm. I, I don't want to blame people who are accessing a system that the politicians set up under the rules they set mm -hmm. up. They, they kind of held up their end. Now the, the system mm -hmm. has to hold up its. It's kind of the same thing we talk about with pensions. Mm -hmm. But at some point, it seems to me the rules of the game need to be changed, mm -hmm. and that's where our focus could be so we don't get into this trap of vilifying seniors who are accessing a system the way that everybody set it up to, to work. Yeah, I think you're onto something, and that can be transformational. And, and the, the diagnostic of that is, if you talk to that person and you say, hey, this is an entitlement, it's like, hey, don't yeah, go yeah, tell yeah. me right. that's an I, entitlement. I, I I've been paying for this. Yeah. And, and there's, there's a lot of merit to that argument. So I think, look, the, the, the maker-taker distinction, um, it, it's clearly not persuasive. And what we've got to do, I think, as, as conservatives going into the 2016 election is we've got to be inviting people. We've, we've got to be the ones that say, hey, this is great. This is a good stuff. This is good for you. It's good for your kids. It's good for the country. And this is an invitation to come back to these core themes that we know actually work because we should be able to take advantage of this, uh, th this, this example of two, you know, two terms of Obama in office all these false promises and a bunch of nonsense that have underperformed and say, we know what doesn't work, come on and let's let's get about to these things and let's let's get to it. And I think there's a great deal of possibility. Well so as a as a conservative thought leader and kind of message development expert really in Congress. And that's really what you are. You kind of, you, you're really kind of unique in Congress in that way. And we've had enough conversations on the radio show and elsewhere to distinguish from people who've kind of read the books and also know how to synthesize the books into messaging that people can consume from people who don't. And you're clearly in the former category. So going back to that original question, uh, you have a President Cruz or a President Rubio or a President Trump, whoever. Uh, and you have McConnell and Ryan in uh, leadership of majorities in Congress. What is realistic on the Hill with a, with a Republican president to move that's transformational? You've got all the Republican candidates that have some version of a real pro-growth tax policy. So mm -hmm. you could make transformative change there. Mm -hmm. Where else do you think is realistic to kind of either unwind what Obama did or promote something that rethinks these big systems in government? So um, besides oh, Medicaid, Medicare. Yep, I get it. So um, the uh, le let me touch on taxes quickly. You mentioned it, but it's worth just kind of reemphasizing. Yeah. The tax code's a disaster. And there's an opportunity to reform this thing, Dan, for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, there's no defender of the status quo. There's nobody out there today that says, it's great, leave it alone. People like certain elements of it, but nobody is defending it in its entirety. That's important. Second thing is the IRS is as malevolent as, as we have come to understand in, in talking back and forth. They're a disaster. They've got a culture of impunity. And the best way to reform that is change the code because they use the complexity to manipulate people to their advantage. Third reason I think tax reform is entirely possible is these companies are going to continuing to invert. So within a mile of here, you've got companies that are just itching to make a jailbreak, basically, to get outside of the United right. States. So tax reform is, is entirely possible beginning in 2017. The other thing is to look at some of these larger spending systems. Now, Medicare is important um, because it's so much of a driver. But to take a look at Obamacare, for example, um, the House has failed in that the House has not offered an alternative to Obamacare. House has basically turned it into a lounge act of criticizing it. It's like, we don't like it. Oh, you know, right. we really don't like it. Right. Without offering anything in, in substance. And the reason is it hasn't been produced is it's hard. And there's not consensus among conservatives about the best way forward. Well, hey, rub some dirt on it. Get over it. <laughs> and, and pass a bill that's an alternative. And I think that... If it's done in 2016, and I think it's likely that it will, that'll be a prelude for, for uh, a Republican president to pick on. You can pick up. You can imagine some of the energy stuff that's possible just in terms of the energy renaissance in the country that's out there. And then the regulatory reform is probably one of the things that I hear most in my constituency in the West and Northwest suburbs. So to begin this pullback, this delegation of authority that's gotten so out of control that the delegated agencies are now trying to do things 
that are too controversial to get through the Congress that created them. How messed up is that? So the passage of something like the RAINS Act, which says that if a piece of legislation is going to have more than a $100 million impact on the economy, it's got to be voted on up or down by the Congress. All that stuff cumulatively, I would argue you get that done in one Congress or you take a running start at one Congress and you can be looking at a very different America with a very different trajectory in 2018 and beyond. Well, we're on the cusp of the premiere of Big Short about the movie about the housing bubble bursting. Right. Uh, what about Dodd-Frank, uh, ironically, yeah. two, the two legislators who were in part responsible for blowing up the bubble and bursting at Chris Dodd and Barney Frank, of course. But I mean, they're still writing the rules to implement the legislation. Uh, what about with respect to Dodd-Frank, the housing market, access to capital for small business owners, uh, some in terms of thinking about specific, we talk about kind of the regulatory state generally, specifically what should be rolled back, what should be rethought uh, such that it would provide uh, the impetus towards capital formation and job creation. Well, what you got to get rid of is the consumer products or the, the CFPB, the Consumer Protection. Elizabeth Warren's agency. So zero accountability, and that's not an overstatement, no accountability to Congress. It's basically a direct appropriation. They don't, they don't have to come back. Um, there's, there's not a sense of accountability, and there's a sense of license, essentially. Um, employees, the, you know, uh, swollen budgets and so forth that are making it very, very difficult. The community bankers out in, um, out, out in the area are really under just great duress. So your point of uh, taking on Dodd-Frank is substantive work. All of these things, you can imagine, you can imagine passing some very significant things out of the House, and then you're back into this old trap of like, okay, how do you get to 60 in the Senate? I would argue that if you've, um, two things become interesting. One is, if you've got somebody in the White House who's pulling for these pieces of legislation substantively, the, um, that, that can be very, very consequential in terms of boosting your votes in the Senate. The other is, if there's a period of time where it looks like you've got a little bit more likelihood of a Republican majority, you may find that Senate Republican leadership, and I'm just speculating, is more open to, to doing the nuclear option, which I would do in a second. Yeah, I right. think the reluctance right now is, hey, we do the nuclear option, and we may lose the majority in 2016. I mean, this is, comes, goes back to risk, right? Yeah. I mean, President Obama seems has no compunction about using a, po uh, a phone and a pen to move things along. I'm with you. Right? What you are hearing, no restraint from Yeah, me. yeah, yeah. Okay, fair enough. Uh, I want to go, go back to another agency you mentioned, the IRS, the most powerful non-military agency in the federal government, and it's increasingly not a non-military agency. The one that and put people in jail? Yeah, that one? yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you've done a lot of work there, and you've traveled to IRS offices like the infamous IRS office in Cincinnati to have conversations with the rank and file mm -hmm. there. Um, uh, you know, a lot. This is another area where people say, "Look, the IRS illegally targeted people for what they believed in terms of their political beliefs, as well as what they believe in terms of their faith." And no one. I mean, it's kind of like the big banks, and no one has gone to jail, and no one's been held accountable. And the DOJ, Department of Justice, says Lois Lerner will not be prosecuted. And William Koskinen, the IRS director, continues to lie before Congress with impunity and without consequence. And we have a 70,000-page uh, IRS code that is unintelligible and unknowable, which means the rule of law has been suspended if people can't know what the law is. So this is where you have people kind of saying, boy, I, want, I wander around Washington, D.C. like Diogenes looking for the one honest man. Right, because people, we all watch what they do. We watch IRS, we watch the VA, three, a re IG report, 300,000 plus veterans die waiting for health care to which they were entitled, to which they fought for this country valiantly to get. I mean, that was our thanks to them. It wasn't why mm -hmm. they did it. And we all say that's terrible and nothing changes. All right, let me focus on the IRS yeah. in particular. Um, the uh, lowest learner, in my opinion, is guilty as sin. Um, the House of Representatives made a criminal referral to this directly, which is an, a very unusual step. Following an investigation, 
the House Ways and Means Committee, and then ultimately the, the entire House of Representatives on a partisan basis made a referral to the Department of Justice. Now, we don't have the capacity to do law enforcement, and we know what the administration's job, or what the administration's disposition is there, and it's very unsatisfying, but it is, um, it laid down a mark. And what has happened is there has been a, um, attempts to try and rein in the IRS. Now, here's how that largely manifests itself. It's largely manifested itself through cutting their budget and pushing back on them with the desire. Um, so we've, we were able to bring in witnesses, Dan, that told compelling stories about, about their targeting. One I want to mention in particular, pro-life uh, pro lady from Iowa comes before the committee, says that she, uh, they, they had filled out their paperwork. They wanted to you know, qualify for their tax-exempt status. IRS sends them a letter back that says, tell us about your activities. Right. It's a threatening, sort of scary letter. And they said, well, we do this, we do that, we do sidewalk counseling, and we do prayer meetings. The IRS wrote back interrogatories, scary IRS letters. Tell us about your prayer meetings. Now, I get worked up even thinking, even telling the story to you. I get, I get angry about this because that is tyranny. That's tyranny. That's intimidation, and that is trying to marginalize something, someone based on their faith. Now, the good news is that pro-life lady and others realized this is not my country. You know what I mean? And they, yeah. they kept faith in their country when it looked like their country didn't keep faith with them, and their country has come to rescue them and to make this stuff right. But this is, um, I take your point that there's people that are walking the streets that should probably be in jail. I accept your premise. I don't have the capacity to put them in jail, um, but we do have the capacity to hold them to account and to bring a spotlight to these things. Now, here's the challenge that we've got as a culture. We've got to make sure that the spotlight and the intensity maintains when our, our, our temptation is to turn attention elsewhere. So do I think that the IRS is targeting people today? Not really. Why? because we're watching them. Because of the scrutiny. Yeah. yeah. I don't think they fundamentally change. In fact, we asked for a GAO study. GAO came back and said that Americans are still at risk in terms of audit practices, because that's the next thing. So Dan Proft is involved in activities, and how do they choose who gets audited and who doesn't? Not just who gets their, their you know, status under this 501 code, but who's getting audited now? And all of a sudden you learn, oh, there's, there's the automated audits, no problem. You know, there's some algorithm, no problem. But then there's the special category of, we're just gonna take a look at these. And there's a great deal of risk. And this is the GAO, nonpartisan, calling balls and strikes, study entity of the United States Congress that's saying, these people are still at risk for this. So the responsibility that guys like me have is, all right, how do you at least try and build in systems so that it mitigates that and there's a restraining influence, but then the responsibility that we all have is to elect people that are going to appoint people of integrity with a high expectation that they're going to do the job. So when you went to visit the Cincinnati office of the IRS, did you begin the meeting with an Our Father? Oh, man. That's what this, you was, this was a really interesting meeting. So I go down there. Everybody hold hands. <laughs> uh, and I just, I, I, I said, I want to go in. I, want, I don't want to take any press. One Ways and Means staffer met me, and, and in we go. And here's what the interesting thing was. We had done a number of bills that, like a week before, going after the IRS. And I was pretty... Um, aggressive on the House floor, calling out the IRS, and, and a guy raises his hand and asked actually the most insightful question. And he, um, he said, I, I saw what you said, you know, YouTube, it's all over the place. Uh, I saw what you said about the IRS, and he goes, hey, when is enough enough? When is enough enough? And I said, fair question. Um, Americans are great at forgiving people. It's really, we're quite charming about it as a country, and culturally, we're fantastic. We can get over things so quickly. But the, the problem is, you got to ask to be forgiven. And you got to feel sorry for what you did. And I said, your problem is that your leadership has not acknowledged that there's been any targeting. In fact, your leadership still talks about alleged targeting. And I said, until that happens, until the IRS says, 
Yeah, it was a disaster, and and we were sticking it to people, and we feel really sorry about it. Then you can't then then you can't turn the page. And he he kind of heard, I think, a little bit of what I said, but it it was a very very interesting meeting. Speaking of the intersection of your work on the Hill, and movies, and the presidential election, the movie Thirteen Hours coming right. out on Benghazi. Uh, you remember the Benghazi Select Committee, uh, Trey Gowdy's committee. You had the occasion to query one former Secretary of State slash presumptive Democrat nominee for President Hillary Clinton. Um, Tell us why the Benghazi committee cannot be relegated to the right wing conjuring up Mm. a conspiracy theory, which is what Hillary Clinton and Democrats, and even not like kind of far left Democrats, but Democrats that just are culturally inclined to be Democrats have been led to believe that this is. This is uh, just us making up stuff. It was terrible that four Americans died, but nobody was responsible. Everybody did their best. And it was just one of those fog of war type situations where the worst possible outcome occurred. Here's why it can't be relegated to that category. Um, There was a reluctance on the part of John Boehner as speaker to create a select committee for all the obvious reasons. Select committees are complicated and difficult to work through. and there were other committees that were in place, and those committees had not completed their investigation. It became clear, though, to Boehner at some point that the administration was not being forthcoming with the documents. And he said, it's game on, we're gonna do a select committee. And the committee was charged with doing two things. Number one, find out what happened. And number two, make recommendations so it would never happen again. Um, The backstory is that Trey Gowdy, chairman of the committee, went to the ranking Democrat, Elijah Cummings, early on in the process and said, look, we got to bring in Hillary Clinton at some point. She was the secretary of state, obviously. Clearly, she's going to run for president. Let's bring her in early and let's avoid all the campaign drama. All we need is um, every document that we've been entitled to. And then you pick the date, you work with her campaign and we'll bring her in and, and we'll have the interview and it'll be done. Well. The administration has been ridiculous, awful, um, a, a complete disaster. Give me some other adjectives here, but stonewalling shame, like that on every shameful, like everything else. Shameful. Um, the most transparent administration in history. So, uh, tens of thousands of documents have now been discovered by the Benghazi Select Committee. All this drama about Hillary Clinton's uh, you know, server and so forth, discovered by the Benghazi Committee. Dozens and dozens of witnesses who have never been interviewed by any other committee of the House of Representatives have now been interviewed. There's about 20 more to go. So here's, here's what I've come to learn. Uh, and this was the nature of the inquiry that I, uh, that I spent my time on when I was asking Hillary Clinton, Clinton questions. It's like, look. Um, she made a decision, it was a judgment call, and the judgment call was, let's get involved militarily in Libya. You can either make the argument for it or make the argument against it, and she made the argument for it, and I, and I, I, I get it, it's her prerogative, she's the Secretary of State. She then goes about persuading you know, all the coalition partners, she gets everybody on board, she, she rolls the Pentagon, and she ultimately gets the president on, on this program. And Gaddafi is killed in October of the year before the Benghazi, uh, the Benghazi murders. Um, at that point, their interest just completely shifted. And I mean, just shifted. They were super interested, they, the administration, she in particular, Hillary Clinton, had 790 emails that the year right. of the activity. That number drops by 90%, not to 90%, it drops by 90%, down to about 70 emails, and her interest just completely wanes. And that's the scandal, I think. The scandal is she is basically risking other people's lives. Now, people have said... And, and the reason is because it, it didn't work out like they envisioned it would work out, so let's just bury it and move on. It didn't fit the narrative. That's right. exactly right. So, it, for example, people have said to me, Peter, how is it possible that they got requests for informa- for subsequent military support and, and security and so forth, I should say security, and it, was, it wasn't just honored and dealt with? And the reason is... You don't send more support to a place that's great. Right. Right. This is going very well. We it's need great. more. It's great. But, but here's the thing. And now, uh, kind of, this is, this is an interesting 
where should the focus be? Should the focus be on that kind of the global policy in Libya and then what they did subsequent to the disintegration of Libya into a former nation state? Or what happened that night? Mm. Uh, email that just came out within the last couple of weeks from the chief of staff to the, to the secretary of defense at seven o'clock that night while the attacks were ongoing saying essentially we can scramble a response team what does the Secretary of State want to do? And they dithered. Right. And no response team was sent. And there's differing opinions, admittedly differing opinions, but people like Gregory Hicks and others believe that it had a team been scrambled to provide aid and support to Ambassador Stevens and his men, no one can say for sure, because this is a, an impossible hypothetical, it's too many variables, but you, potentially, potentially, they or some of them could have been saved. And that's not a conversation that it seems, well, certainly the, the regime doesn't want it to have or Hillary doesn't want to have as candidate for president. But it almost seems like nobody in America wants to have it. We just want to say that's the past. It was terrible. And um, despite all the protestations that we want to learn from what happened so we don't repeat it, seems like it's too uncomfortable for us to have that conversation. So, you're, I mean, you're hitting on a really sensitive point, and the, the, the underlying commitment that the United States makes, or should make, is we ask people to go to dangerous places and do difficult things. People in the military, people in the clandestine services, diplomats, and so forth. And they're willing to go, and they know that there's no guarantee when they go that they're going to be safe. There's no guarantee. But the deal that the United States makes with them is if they get in harm's way, then their country is going to urgently come in to their rescue. And you may or may not be successful in the rescue. And if they die, they know that people are on the way. And that didn't happen here. And four people were murdered. Now, the, the, the difficulty is the assertion that it would never have made any difference. It's like to your point, it's proving a negative. You don't know that at the time that you're making the decision. So Hillary Clinton is emailing her family about what's right. going on at the exact time when, when two men are on the roof trying to save themselves and protect people. And at the same time, the White House is doing what? The White House is communicating from a messaging point of view, getting out the false narrative that it's a video that has started this up. You see how, how out of sync that is, how uh, how troubling it is, how uh, the priorities are all off, as opposed to saying, hey, game on and get these people home. Well, the other thing that's interesting about that, to what you described as the implicit promise of service to our country, whether in the military or the foreign service, isn't that the argument that President Obama made with respect to the Taliban Five for Bo Bergdahl? Mm. We have a responsibility to leave no man behind, even a deserter. So we're going to trade five senior Taliban terrorists for Bo Bergdahl. We're going to paper over the fact that six of our men died in combat in places they wouldn't have been but for searching for their platoon mate, Bo Bergdahl, because we have a duty to Bo Bergdahl, even as a deserter. That's right. So we have a duty to Bo Bergdahl, and he doesn't see the same duty. He hasn't made the same argument with respect to Ambassador Stevens and his men on that night, September 11th, 2012. That's a good insight. That's a really good insight. And I think you're, I think you're spot on. And it, you could just shrug it off as irony, um, except it's, it's more than irony because people died as a result of this. Let's talk about the presidential race, uh, Hillary Clinton's imminent uh, nominations as a Democrat candidate. It's a good segue. Um, your sense of the presidential race, I think this is a race that uh, few people would have predicted, would have turned out this way as we right. sit here in December of 2015. Uh, it seems like it's kind of a three-person race right now, mm -hmm. Trump, Rubio, and Cruz. Mm -hmm. uh, why do you think we've gotten to this place and how do you assess the race if it's those three or, in your opinion, a bigger field? Um, <clears throat> I think that it is, uh, originally I thought that, the, that this was gonna turn out to be Bush versus not Bush. Right. It was gonna be a binary choice. Right. And you know, it would've been a real rough and tumble sort of deal and, and the country or the, the party would have made its choice. Obviously it's turning out to be Trump versus not Trump. And that's a big surprise. I didn't see it coming and I don't think very many people did. I did, no, uh, I, actually, I didn't. I thought Trump would be done by Labor Day just like most yeah, people. Yeah, I, I um, so, so, you know, that said, I think moving forward, 
look, we've got a lot of polls. We've got a lot of discussion. We need to have some elections now. We, you know, we've got to thin the herd here because the class of people, the political consulting class that has been whispering in people's ears <laughs> saying, hey, I've got a pathway for you in Iowa and lightning's going to strike and right. you're going to love it, right. that the, the, the shelf life on that is, is it, it's coming to an end. So I think mercifully we're going to be into an election, you know, Comparatively. Not, not to be fair, you don't know what it's like to have political consultants saying, you as an do underdog, this. marginal candidate, that you can. There's a pathway to victory. I know what that. I know the hurt. <laughs> You're Mr. Victory all the yeah, time. I'm not. I'm not I that guy. Yeah, so I, I think you've done I, all right. I, I like. You yeah, know, talk to the hand. Right, I'm not I'm, interested. I'm. 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 You know, holding out hope for Rick Santorum. <laughs> <laughs> I'm holding out hope for a, George my... Pataki. <laughs> That's it. Uh, so I think I, I, I think it's going to settle down, and then and then look, there's uh, you'll appreciate this. I was in Poland in August, and I did an interview with on conservative the, revolution in Poland. <laughs> telling Poland. you, uh, and and the polls were really interested about American po- presidential politics. They should said, with uh, Putin's ascendancy. So they. Uh, I said, okay, you want to run for president of the United States? Here's what you got to do. Um, number one, remember, it's miserable to become the nominee of a major party. And it is. It is. It's the only proving ground that we basically have. And it's miserable. We put people through uh, an experience the likes of which most people can't stand. So here's your constituencies that you got to navigate. You've got to deal with the grassroots activists in the early states. That's you're, you're spending a disproportionate amount of time talking to the county chairman of whatever it happens to be in this Tea Party group and that pro-life group and so forth in three early states. Your next constituency is a donor class. Right. There's you know, many billionaires, many just wealthy people. They can't buy an election, but they're gonna have influence, and, and there's a donor class. Your, the media is your third group. They're trying to trip you up and make your life miserable. And then the fourth group are your opponents on the stage. That's a constituency. You've gotta beat them, but if you go toxic on them, they're gonna hate your guts, and they're not gonna campaign for you vigorously in the fall, and you cannot win without the support of all those people on the stage. So, go figure it out. And that's what we're that's now what we're what we're navigating through. So, there's predictions about this, you know, how does Cruz for example handle Trump now that Trump is getting maybe more aggressive against Cruz. And it'll be it'll be interesting to see because this is all this is all new ground. No, but nobody knows. But don't you think how interesting it is how far it has moved away from the establishment because right now if you believe that it's down to the final 3 Trump, Rubio and Cruz, the establishment candidate is a guy who was the Tea Party candidate for Senate in Florida in 2010. Go think, yeah, amazing. Right, so I mean, that is, mo- and I, you know, and I don't really treat Rubio as some kind of tool of the establishment. I think that's unfair to him. Right. I think he's a little bit more independent than that. But, but I mean, that's how far kind of the, the earth has shifted yeah. within the Republican Party with the likes of Carson and Fiorina and Trump as re- kind of true outsiders to the system coming right. in. And, and that says something about where the electorate is, and it may say something about the composition of our electorate, particularly as it relates to white, middle-income voters, age 40 to 55, who have been jettisoned by the Democrats. I mean, President Obama almost explicitly jettisoned them in 2012, said, you know, they're gone, mm-hmm. we're, we're giving them up, and we're gonna exchange them for uh, pumping up our base of minority voters, as well as young voters. That's our play. That's the future of the Democrat Party. That's the Obama winning coalition. And frankly, the way he did it, making Romney box office poison, it was effective for mm-hmm. him. So, you know, good for him. You know, you bow to mm-hmm. the victor. Um, but but Trump has jumped onto something. And I think Cruz is in kind of in that same vein of a base plus strategy where we have this electorate the segment of the electorate that has been seeded by the Democrats that I just described. Mm -hmm. Uh, White, working, middle-income voters, not college educated, who've been jettisoned by the Democrats, who've seen their quality of life, their purchasing power decline over the last 15 years, and they're in no man's land. They don't like the Democrats, they understand they've been jettisoned, but they haven't been embraced by the Republicans until, frankly, Trump came along. Mm -hmm. And so what about that in terms of the future 50% 50% plus one coalition, governing coalition, the Republicans are going to have at the presidential level, as well as in Midwestern states like Illinois 
at the state level. So, you know, there's that adage that demography is destiny. And right. I think that there's there's something to that, but I think it's, over, it's, it's, it's just overstated. And there's, what you're describing is a group of people that have been basically abandoned. Right. And that then, and then. And ridiculed. Yeah. Um, right. So what you're describing then is uh, a, a bunch of people in my constituency. So these are yeah. people who are living in the west and northwest suburbs, uh, manufacturing jobs, more and more and more challenging. You know what I mean? There, there's, there's less than, less than that. Um, they want to send their kids to college, and they're feeling like, hey, this college cost thing. I'm pressing up my nose against the glass, looking in on this deal, and this is really, really taking my breath away. And, um, and, and, and they, they may not have been directly impacted by targeting, let's say, by the IRS, but they're feeling like complexity of the tax code. I'm trying to do my taxes on the you know, the weekend before my taxes are due and my dining room table is a hodgepodge of all this junk and I can't figure out if I'm eligible for this thing or if I'm not eligible for this thing and I'm probably paying too much in stinking taxes and nobody's going to tell me about it. Well, so that, that's your group. Well, the other thing I think they're thinking, this is me projecting, um, but I think they're thinking, I love America. Mm -hmm. I play by the rules and now I'm being told I'm the problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's really something, mm -hmm. right? I'm being told by the political ruling class, as Angelo Cotavia defined it, and a Boston University professor who kind of famously said in advance of this election cycle, whoever says those people in Washington, who the hell do they think they are, is going to do really well. Wow. And that's Donald Trump. Mm. Who the, I know all these people, and they're even worse than you think. Mm -hmm. That's Donald Trump, right? Yeah. Um, and those people are saying, wait a second, I did everything right. And now you're telling me I'm the bad guy? Right. How did I become the bad guy? It's almost like Michael Douglas and falling down. How, how did I become the bad guy? Now let's not go full, right. full falling down. Right. But I mean, but there's really something to that, and that's a constituency to be owned. That's not to the exclusion of saying the Republican Party needs to do better with Latino families and mm -hmm. African American families, but it's also to say, wait a second, those white, working, and I, I don't like class because we don't live in a cased system, but working and middle income families, mm -hmm. I mean, they deserve representation too. Mm -hmm. They're not the bad guys. Right. And, representation. And, somebody, and somebody needs to say that to them in our party. Right. Representation and consideration. So take the, take the Medicare theme that we were talking about a couple of minutes ago, and you overlay onto top of that a demographic that's a little bit older than the 50, 40 to 55. Yeah, yeah. And all of a sudden, you're, at a, you're, at, you're talking to that same person who says, I, I'm no taker. I, I put right. into this. Don't right. tell me I'm a taker. That's right. Uh, here's my check. I've been paying into this system. Now they've been greatly benefiting net net, but um, but yeah, I think that I think that's that's part of part of the challenge. So here's if if you're the Republican nominee, here's what you got to do. Um, you've got to speak to that audience and not turn off everybody else. And if you can figure that out then you can, you can probably be the next president of the United States. Because Hillary's gonna play to type. And if we're able to run a generational theme, if, if we're able to say, this is about tomorrow, and we're not litigating yesterday, that's a great place. Well, that's, and, and it's interesting to have Cruz and Rubio, they're both 44-year-old, you know, Latinos. I mean, I know in the, for the Democrats, Cubans don't count as Latinos. I count them as Latinos. Uh, they're from, you know, Latin America. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but I think that's right. Uh, I think that's exactly right, that you have this opportunity to kind of combine both while Hillary plays the Larry Johnson grandmama routine, you know, right. all dressed up. Right. Less attractive than Larry Johnson. Yeah. But. Look, and she's, she's, um, she lost to Barack Obama. She lost. So this myth of Clinton invis invincibility, and this is, oh, this is just all a fiat accomplice. Yeah, These people right. have this done. It's like, no. Well, isn't this the funny thing? And you watch Hillary Clinton on the stump or in these debates, and to translate it locally, you watch Rahm Emanuel with all of the controversies that have beset him, and you uh, realize, you know what? They're not very good at this. Mm -hmm. They're not good candidates. Mm -hmm. They've essentially succeeded based on the failure of their opponents. I mean, other than Hillary Clinton running into a buzzsaw in 2008, but, but Hillary kind of nationally mm -hmm. being given a Senate seat after her tenure mm -hmm. as first lady, uh, and then now being kind of offered up as the presumptive Democrat nominee. And then, uh, you know, the, the part of the cabal there, Rahm Emanuel, that spun off to Chicago. Mm -hmm. Boy, when controversy strikes, 
they're not particularly good at that because they're essentially impersonating a three-dimensional human being and people see through it. And they're, I don't think they're as intuitive as, as, as they've created this impression that they are. You know, I think that they've, they've created a false, a false narrative basically and that, uh, oh, we're just so great at this and this is all we do and this is all we think about. Yeah, you think about it a lot and you do this stuff a lot, but you haven't become that skilled at it. And if they were that skilled at it, you wouldn't have Republican majorities in both the House and the Senate under Obama's leadership, right under his nose, as a great restraining influence, notwithstanding our earlier discussion on the whole rest of the agenda that they would have had, that they would have absolutely done. They would have done Obamacare 2.0, they would have done more stimulus, they'd have doubled down on um, cap and trade, they'd have doubled down on Dodd-Frank, and they were not able to do those things legislatively where all the pressure went then because that was dammed up and they couldn't get through it. All that pressure, that flow went to the regulatory side. Well, this seems to me one of the things Republicans need to remind ourselves of and everybody else sometimes. Uh, we're not the minority or party. Majorities in Congress, two-thirds of state legislatures nationwide. Obama has been the greatest recruiter of Republican votes outside of for himself. No question. As well as the best gun, gun salesman. Sales. <laughs> yeah, exactly. In the last seven years. Yeah. I mean, you know, without without exception. Um, I know you, so I know your job is federal, but you're in Illinois. You're in DuPage County. You watch this. You were a state legislator before you were a congressman. Uh, your comments on the state of the state with this impasse between Governor Rauner and supermajority Democrat leaders Madigan and Cullerton in the, uh, in the House and the Senate, how you think Governor Rauner is playing this, uh, offering up kind of pushback to Madigan and Cullerton for the first time in at least a generation? For the first time ever. So what's yeah, interesting right. is mm -hmm. Madigan is now forced out into the open, basically. And for years, people didn't know who Michael Madigan was, and he's, you know, like, People just didn't know him. They didn't know how much authority he had. And now what Governor Rauner is doing is he's forcing Madigan out in the open. And he's forcing him into press conferences and into discussing these things. Um, there's now more of an awareness in terms of the, just the general fiscal nature of the, 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 the terrible fiscal shape and the $100 billion unfunded liability that is, Ill in, that is Illinois. And so what I appreciate about Governor Rauner is He's bringing it. You know what I mean? My constituency, if you ask folks out in DuPage and the Northwest suburbs, they say, stand your ground, right. Governor. Stand, hang in there, and don't, don't, don't give in to these guys. Now, I mean, at some point, he's going to he's gonna have to do something. But, you know, it's basically what we're observing is unstoppable force meets immovable object. And I am rooting for the unstoppable force of Governor Rauner. And what about the prospects in the city of Chicago? I mean, we've seen Republicans elected in New York, mm -hmm. in LA. Chicago is a more culturally conservative big city than either of those two. With Rahm's disintegration and the disintegration of major institutions like the police and the schools in the city of Chicago, an opportunity for Republicans maybe to establish a beachhead in Chicago, change the conversation, change the alliances of minority families politically in this state, and change the state of Illinois' trajectory so that maybe Rauner has some reinforcement. Yeah, that's right. I mean, so so my my memory is that Governor Rauner got 22% of the Republican vote in um, in the city of Chicago. Uh, of the overall vote in the uh, city. Um, and so I think moving forward, look, Years ago, it was when Giuliani started running, it was like, oh, come on, how nice for you. Isn't that just a nice little civics project? And, right. you know, he was a transformational mayor for, uh, for New York, followed by Bloomberg and so forth. So these big cities have an appetite for, for mayors that can turn things around. And this place has gone from bad to worse. I mean, this place, that is the city of Chicago, is unraveling. And you go around you go around America, people love Chicago. They love coming here, they love visiting here. It's got, you know, it's a great reputation until you understand kind of the, 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 the underlying uh, stresses in the architecture. And, um, and it's a city that just deserves better leadership all the way around. What do you think about uh, the prospects of this recall legislation that's been introduced in Springfield and Republicans signing on to legislation that was introduced by a West Side, Chicago West Side Democrat? Uh, why shouldn't Republicans be on this bill as co-sponsors to impose a recall mechanism on the mayor and aldermen in the city of Chicago? Just like in the state now we have 
for the governor and for state legislators. So I think it's important to have two elements to this. Um, as Republicans, I would wait for the Democrat to, to, to take the lead, and what you've described is that happening. So the old adage, when your opponents are unraveling, get out of the way. And so um, they're clearly, the Democrats in the city are clearly having a difficult time. And if you can create more pressure on them to force that discussion for the betterment of the citizens and particularly families in the city of Chicago, that's a winning proposition, which is a which is all to say GOP should get on and, and, and get pushing. It's being led by a West Side Democrat. What's not to love about that? And what's the future of Peter Roscom? I mean, in terms of uh, you were in leadership, you're, you're very close friends and allies, philosophical and political allies with Paul Ryan. Uh, do you aspire to leadership in the House again? Do you aspire to per potentially a statewide run in Illinois? Uh, if Hillary Clinton's nominee, are you going to run for president in 2020? Go. I don't know, Prof. You, this you, gig you're doing is looking pretty good to me. Be, so, um, do you want to be the Secretary General of the UN? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, uh, so go back to Henry Hyde. Henry Hyde served for three decades plus. I don't, I don't think I'll make that in the, in the House of Representatives. Um, I love serving in the House. It is an institution that's closest to the people. I will serve there for uh, the following duration, as long as my district keeps saying, hey, we want you to represent us. And as long as I feel like I'm doing something that's substantial and, and consequential. If this responsibility ever dissolves into being called congressman and seeing your name in the paper and walking in parades, then I'll be out. If I don't feel like I'm, I'm, I'm doing something. And right now I feel like the work that we're doing is significant and it's a very exciting consequential time to be involved so i'm happy to be in the house i thoroughly enjoy it and i really do view it as one of the great privileges of my life to be able to represent these communities that i grew up in and you grew up in I did, that's um, right in the house of representatives henry hyde and peter roscom two of my favorite arguments against term limits <laughs> peter roscom congressman peter roscom thanks so much for joining thanks, us Dan. in this edition of against the current appreciate it thank you